Hey, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Good to have everyone back. This is uh, Stephen Sachs. I'm the artistic director of the Fountain Theater in Los Angeles. And welcome to Theater Talk. We are streaming live on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, Zoom, and on our Fountain Theater website. And if you're watching on Zoom and you have a question for our guest, please type it into the Q&A balloon down at the bottom of the screen. Or if you're watching on Facebook, type your question in the chat section over on the side. So uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions throughout uh, the program today. And those questions will be fielded by our fabulous producer, James Bennett and myself. So our guest today is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> yes, uh, winner of the Tony Award, the Writers Guild Award, and he has been nominated for the Emmy Award three times. He is the author of 18 plays, including Building the Wall, which had its world premiere at the Fountain Theater, all the way the Great Society, and The Kentucky Cycle. And he wrote the screenplay for Hacksaw Ridge. He is currently working with John Doyle on a new musical called The Twelve and a feature film, The Last Airman, for Jake Gyllenhaal, and another film, Union, for Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It is my pleasure to welcome my pal, Robert Schenken. Robert? Hi. There you are. You made it. I am. We did it. We did it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, en entrances are all. It's a uh, uh, technically challenged as I am. This was a real <laughs> accomplishment. So. <laughs> well, it gets much easier from here. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Pleasure. That. Pleasure really, to be really, here. I really appreciate it. So you're um, you're holding up right now in uh, in New York City, right? New York City, that's right. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And how are how are things there? How, uh, it's uh it's it's good. I mean, people are being very very responsible. Um, we're in stage three of the opening, um, and that seems to be holding even. Mm -hmm. A little uptick in a few of the stats, potentially worrisome. But, um, you know, we went through a really, really terrible, terrible time here in April. Of course. Um, and now we seem to be on the other side of that. So um, it's, it's good to be in New York uh, with my people and my friends, um, even in this disembodied way. So, yeah. Are you, are you able to get work done during this uh, period? And I talked to writers and it kind of goes either way. Some are saying, I can't, I can't write right now. I can't focus. I'm too freaked out. I'm too worried. I can't concentrate. Others are saying, yes, I'm using this time to hunker down and focus. And others just, you know, need to do the work. So sure. where, um, where, where are you at in that? I find anxiety a great stimulant. Well, uh, <laughs> it's, part of, it's, it's part of the life of the theater, isn't it? <laughs> I, uh, I actually have been very creative during this period in some ways mm -hmm. and so in, incredibly anxious. And there have been moments where really it, it was an effort just to get out of bed. Um, yeah. Like everybody else. Yeah, um, absolutely. Very, very stressful times. But I, but I have actually managed um, to do work and to do some good work. I think what I can't seem to do right now is write specifically to this moment. Um, I just can't respond uh, right now creatively to everything that's going on. I'm sure down the road uh, I will, but that's the one aspect of my creative work that I haven't been able to engage. And so it's interesting in that way. Yeah, I, I understand it. It's still unfolding, of course. Uh, and and uh, Unfolding and, and every day and almost every hour is a new outrage, uh, you know, a new shock yeah. from a uh, White House cattle prod. And, um, and that, of course, is intentional. Um, and yeah, so yeah. just uh, staying conscious, uh, staying open, empathetic, mm -hmm. and 
a creative is a, is a political action in, in these times, I think. A so, sure. uh, you, you were born in, in, uh, in Tennessee, right? No, no, North Carolina. Oh, um, I read somewhere it was Tennessee. Is that, was that yes, I know some, some, uh, some reviewer like 35 years ago got that wrong. Oh. It has, it, thanks to the web, it's, it's lived on. I don't know why that should float to the top of anybody's <laughs> But <laughs> like, Look at me. Uh, but, not that I have anything against Tennessee, and I actually did have family <laughs> in, in uh, Knoxville. But no, I was actually born in Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. So I'm a Tar Heel by birth. Oh, excellent. Uh, but, but, a Texan, I, I, but a Texan uh, by uh, uh, Yeah, uh, I was going to say, true or false, you, act, you did grow up in Austin, right? I did. I did. Yes, I, I moved there when I was very young and, and grew up and went to college there and, and still have family in, in central Texas. So. Yeah, Texas, of course, is just being hammered right now. Yes, um, and, and they, they haven't seen the worst of it. Yeah. They haven't seen the worst of it yet. That's, it's just coming. So gr growing up in, in uh, Austin, uh, tell me about your parents. <laughs> Were it's funny you ask. I, one of the things, one of my projects right now, my, uh, my father, uh, during World War, World War II, served in the Navy as a bomb disposal officer, so a very dangerous job. And um, my mother was an actress in New York, and during the war she actually toured uh, in, with the USO in a production of Arsenic and Old Lace, <laughs> uh, Army bases, uh, uh -huh. country, and in the Aleutian Islands. And um, he wooed her, uh, family mythology has, um, yes. by these letters that he wrote her from, from uh, Vanuatu, which is where he was stationed for the largest part of his tour. And uh, the, these letters have always been kind of legendary in my family, and I finally pulled them out uh, and started to transcribe them. And um, they're really... They're really quite wonderful. You know, he's 24, 25, she's 21. Um, he's, uh, he's working really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but well, he's, you know. uh, but he's, he's charming and funny. Oh my God, that's wonderful. Creative and... Um, did you discover something surprising? Anything kind of surprised you? Or did you learn something you didn't know or, or never? I, well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, it's really shedding a whole new light on my parents to see them at this age uh, and under these circumstances, because I'm reading these and, uh, and I, I have actually uh, um, uh, audible uh, has uh, commissioned me to write a piece based on these letters, the Bob and Jean letters. No. And I, I, I have this feeling that whenever we get to the other side of this place, COVID, yeah. um, that a story about uh, two young people uh, at a time when the world also genuinely seemed like it might not be there tomorrow, um, but made the decision nonetheless to fall in love and plan a future together mm. actually be kind of appealing to uh, to audiences. So, um, so I, I'm a, I'm very much in their world right now. My my dad uh, was a playwright. Actually, he had got his degree in playwriting, and um, um, it was very interested in acting as well. My mother insisted he he could not be an actor. <laughs> And uh, so while he was overseas in the Navy, he got really interested in the whole idea of television and video as a teaching tool and came back and uh, made a career in public television. He was a pioneer in public television and in the world, really. And, um, and my mother, um, they got married, they had four children. I'm the, the third of the four. So I grew up in a house that was, um, very literate and uh, very interested in theater. There were plays uh, in the bookcases. Mm -hmm. And um, and I read and cared about theater from a very, very early age. Uh, and, and you were, you started out acting. Uh, I did. Yeah. I, I did. I, I went to the University of Texas um, 
uh, as a plan to honor student uh, department of drama double major and then to Cornell for an MFA in acting and then came to New York. So, uh, and I was a professional actor for a decade right. in New York and Los Angeles and uh, had a good career, um, you know, by the, by the standards of the day. I supported myself and my family. Um, but um, I also wrote uh, from the very beginning. And, um, but, but I wrote uh, uh, on the side as it were uh, backstage uh, in my trailer on uh, television shows or what have you. Um, and eventually the writing became more pleasurable um, mm -hmm. than acting. Uh, mm -hmm. It felt more creative. I could own it more truly. I was more in charge of what I was doing. So the, the eventual transition from actor to writer was really not all that painful. I had the same experience when I was Did you? I was an actor once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, and <laughs> um, and I also had the same feeling. There came a point as a as a as a young actor where I it was I wanted to be more in control of my own destiny in a way, and I I, I just uh, I found a book that I wanted to adapt, and I just turned it into a a, a play. Uh, in fact, this was around the same time that I think that you were doing uh, Tall Tales uh, at, on, at EST in LA. Uh, and I was doing, I had done this, an adaptation of The Baron in the Trees. Both both of us with uh, our, our pal yes. Tuck Milligan, of course. That's right. That's um, right. So, but, I, but I understand that feeling too of, of, of um, transitioning from actor to, 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 to playwright or director um, and having that feel more uh, satisfying. I, uh, I, what happened is that I, I had a play off Broadway um, at the WPA Theater, um, a, a good play, a play that I'd taken to the O'Neill, and simultaneously was shooting a movie in Los Angeles and, and flying back and forth and feeling very full of myself. Um, but what happened uh, was that I was not able to really keep my eye on the ball in New York on the production and um, and uh, the ship went off course and the and the play hurt was damaged and so I swore after that I would never never do that again so the next play was the Kentucky cycle and um, I, I actually stopped acting um, for the two and a half months leading up to the opening and then a month afterwards which was a big gamble. Uh, at the, I had a, had a young family and um, I was a sole support and I just quit acting so I could really focus on this <laughs> enormous, whatever the hell this thing was uh, and try to get it launched. And, and of course it, it, it turned out very well and there was the whole experience was thrilling. And that's when, that's when I made the decision that, you know, really this is what I should be doing. And right. That's what I've been doing ever since. I remember so clearly, uh, this, this is now like the mid to late 80s, uh, when, when uh, Tall Tales and uh, I think was first over at, at Ensemble Studio Theater. Yes, uh, yeah. well, I mean, it, it, Ensemble Studio Theater in New York and then in, and then LA. in, in LA. Yeah, That's when you right. were in Los Angeles. Uh, I was a member there uh, at EST in LA as well. And I remember, uh, to this day, I remember the buzz that, oh, Robert's writing this play. He's writing this piece of, that's about Indians <laughs> and Kentucky. And, you know, and, and there was just a, a lot of excitement around it. And there was talk that Tabor was interested and, and they were interested. And there was just a lot of buzz and excitement around this 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 project. That, 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 yeah, you know, it, it was great. It was great. And I'm very grateful to, EST, and it's a good example of the importance in the American theater ecosystem of small member theaters like that, because uh, I don't know where else I would have been able to get that kind of support. I did eventually, the taper did uh, give me uh, a, a small workshop, and then a year later, uh, a two-week workshop um, at which uh, Tony Kushner also uh, opened his uh, Angels in America. Oh that, uh, oh that. So in the same in the same workshop series, and now here's here's the punchline. Uh, Gordon Davids, the artistic director of Mark Tabor Forum, 
passed on both plays. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then brought them back. And then, and then as soon as both plays began to succeed, uh, Gordon. Gordon said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've always loved Wait this work. Yeah, I've always loved this. <laughs> <laughs> to his credit, he did, uh, he did actually fly to Seattle, which was where yes. the air was, to see it. And, uh, and you know, said, no, we've got to do this. And he cleared a space in the upcoming season, which I believe was their 25th anniversary season. It was a very well made the centerpiece. So I remember that. He was on board. He was fully on board. <laughs> But for all, all the, my fellow writers out there who have been rejected so many times, <laughs> take that story with you. That's all you come away with. This, because the truth is, most of these people don't know anything. So. <laughs> As William Goldman said so well. Um, one of the things that I love so much about Kentucky Cycle is, is the mythology. The mythological element of it, and it, to me, it, it was such a, a re-examination of our country's mythology. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about mythology lately. We're just coming out of the Fourth of July, and 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 what's happening in our country right now, and uh, just reading and Hamilton happening, and uh, I just recently reading uh, a, a story about George Washington and how George Washington. His his uh, wooden teeth. They weren't wooden. They were actually pulled from the uh, from the slaves. They were pulled right. teeth. Human uh, teeth. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, human teeth uh, from the, from the slaves. And that you know Monticello wasn't Thomas Jefferson's family estate. It was uh, his plantation with three hundred slaves. And so th this idea of like in Hamilton, who tells your story? Um, the, the story that, that, that we tell ourselves about our country. Uh, and there seems to be this, this movement happening now where, where part of the country wants to, uh, you know, the pulling down of the statues, uh, the renaming of schools, uh, the acknowledging of Native American land. There's this fight between those who are demanding to rewrite our nation's mythology and, and those who are desperately still clinging to it. Can, can you talk to me a, a little a bit about that? Well, I mean, I think we need, to, we need to call it what it is. It's white supremacy. Um, and it's been the dominant story for 200 plus years. And we're having a moment of reckoning um, where partially because of this political crisis uh, brought on by the current president, Republican Party, uh, and partially by um, the virus, which is, which has been accelerated by the president and the Republican Party, um, even white people are really feeling the pain in a way they never have, and uh, I think that, in combination with the younger generation, which thank God for them, is um, much more uh, willing to engage in the world, much less willing to sit back and just accept. That we're, we're in a moment of, of real confrontation, um, uncertainty, uh, great passion, great pushback, as, as one would expect. Power never gives up power willingly. You, you have to seize it. Um, and there is a chance, I think, a hope anyway, of real change, perhaps. Um, that's, that's certainly the thing that I cling to uh, in, in these darker moments. Uh, it, it often feels like two steps forward, one step back. Um, and it's important to acknowledge the advances and gains that are being made, uh, while at the same time maintaining the pressure and, and not giving up because they certainly are not. And this is this is really going to be a battle royale, and it's going to go on for a long time. Um, so it's it's really uh, you know I I felt that we were entering a moment of terrible political crisis in 2016, and that's when I wrote um, Building the Wall. Uh, it was my first response to this, and then a year later, the investigation. Uh, all right, or 16 months later, the investigation. 
Um, but I did not anticipate how crazy it would truly get. I mean, even I am shocked by, by some of this. Um, and um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting time to live through, a, a, a potentially revolutionary time. Yeah, well, you talk about building the wall and, and, and uh, it's, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've been sent uh, emails from our Fountain Theater uh, patrons and, and <clears throat> members saying uh, how, how, how they can't get that play out of their minds, especially now, and how so much of what you foretold in that play um, has come to pass. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the really the great takeaway from the play, uh, not so much the plot points about the atrocities on the border, although that certainly has happened, yeah. but the, the whole notion of the slippery moral slope, how easily how easily people can allow themselves to be co-opted, how easily people surrender their will to an authoritarian figure or state, uh, and, and what terrible, terrible things can ensue when a people uh, give up their moral and ethical responsibilities. That's really the big takeaway. That's why we are where we are. You know, when you have a, it's not simply that you have a renegade president, you, you have a, a political party which has become a cult and uh, and which is his greatest enabler. That's that's the really shocking thing. That's the shocking thing. All these people telling themselves whatever they're telling themselves at night. Um, oh, it's terrible, but it'll be over soon. Oh, it's terrible, but we got two Supreme Court justices. Oh, it's terrible, but I'm going to be reelected and and then I'll be able to do the good things that I really would like to do, but I can't do right now. So he won't tweet about me. It's a, it's, that's, that's the real takeaway, I think, from building the wall and the thing that we have seen uh, ex expand in such terrible and um, both predictable and surprising ways. You know, when I think back on, on our time uh, on building the wall during that, that period, there was such an accelerated timeline uh, of that. There was such um, a, a speed. I, I think you sent me the play in, in October or November or something like that. And yes, it yes. read it immediately and, and said we had to do it. And we were in rehearsal like <laughs> within a month, I think, or so. We were. We and were. we opened <laughs> like in January it, because we, we, you and I both uh, were, were caught up in the urgency of now, that this had to yeah. be had right. to be expressed right now. And it was really, uh, f for me and for the Fountain Theater, and, and I assume for you, uh, oh, um, a, a heady ex uh, experience to feel like, like theater, which is usually glacial in its, <laughs> you know, in its development yes. and, and production. Uh, here, we, we had a fire. We, we, we were igniting a fire and being able to do something so fast and so quickly uh, and, and, and really being in dialogue with the time. You know? I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of, of what we did and, and very grateful to you and the Fountain Theater and the Fountain family uh, for the way in which you threw yourself into this and the way in which so many theaters, you know, that play has gone on. It's had 60 plus productions in the United States, 25 different states. It's my most produced play internationally. Is that right? You know, it's, um, it's, it, it's really had an impact and it also um, it illuminated things for me in, in a very interesting way. I had become after a long time in the theater, I think a creature of habit kind of calcified in, in how I approach the work and the business of the work. Right. This, this just broke all that open and it was, it was exciting and it was liberating and it was a great reminder of the true power of the theater as you know the an actor in the light telling a story right. um, that's all you need that's all you've ever needed it's all we've ever needed and i and i think that the that people don't realize too and if you don't mind me sharing that you were you were such an advocate throughout the whole process and were saying we have to get this play out and not interested in getting royalty any kind of payment for it. All, all you cared about was, was getting the, the, the play out there and, and giving theaters around the country the opportunity 
to to mount it. And it, I did. I did. Uh, I, I told my agent that look, I don't care who does this or where they do it. You know, whether it's a Lord Theater or it's a church basement, um, there's no hold back here. There's no strategy about how do we get this into New York. I just want this out and I want it done. And I and I have to give a big shout out to the National New Play Network. Um, that was my first experience for them. And what a what a phenomenal organization they are. Yes. Uh, Nan Burnett runs that. Um, all of those theaters, you know, so many theaters immediately signed on to this great adventure. And it was, uh, again, it was another revelatory experience to my embarrassment that I was not so as aware of this uh, organization, the good work it was doing before this. I certainly am now. And it just brought me in touch with so many theaters across the country whose work I didn't know, and so many theater makers that I hadn't met, and for which I'm supremely grateful now for this collaborative process that we had together, which started here in Los Angeles at the Fountain. Yeah. Okay, so here's a, a, a real nuts and bolts uh, question. And I really, and I love talking about this just as a, as a fellow playwright, just kind of writer geek talk. Um, <laughs> Just tell me, like, what do you do? You write on Final Draft? Is that the software that that you write on? I do. I do. Yes. Uh -huh. And what is your um, your daily writing routine when you're working regularly on something? Do you have a, a fixed schedule? And, and I do. I do. I'm, I I find I I really need to be be disciplined about it. So um, it may be the only thing I really have going. <laughs> <laughs> may not be any good, but God damn it, I'm that, there you know? every morning. That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I rise early and... Uh, How early? There was a... T oh, uh, six. Yeah. Six mm -hmm. There was a time when I would go to the gym. I don't do that anymore. I see. Uh, but I get up and I, and I have breakfast and I read the paper, uh, mm -hmm. much of the papers I can tolerate. And then I'm at my desk and I work and I and I work un, until till noon, um, and that's that's pretty sacrosanct. I really try not to schedule anything that'll take me out of my writing time and my writing schedule. Mm -hmm. in the afternoon, uh, usually devoted to the business of the business, right? Uh, correspondence, uh, you know, d domestic stuff. Uh, unless I'm I'm really under deadline, uh, unless I'm really slammed, in which case, you know, then I then I'll work the rest of the day. I there was a time in my life where I would do that seven days a week, and um, <laughs> no more, <laughs> no more. No. No, no, it's not really it's not really healthy. Um, it's not a good thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and so now I I'm, I very consciously break my day, and particularly here in quarantine <clears throat> where one is already limited in terms of where you can go and what you can do right. um, i i find it really necessary to, to be, make very clear boundaries for myself work time is over now this is a time to read for pleasure or have a conversation or see a friend or take a walk mm -hmm. um, you know uh, do yoga. I do a lot of yoga these days. Really? Oh. I do. I've been, I've been, um, I don't think I've missed a day in my practice. Wow. It's uh, late February. And um, it, it's, it's been a huge factor in my equilibrium and my sanity and my physical health. So for me, it's a really good thing. I'm not here to sell anybody on it, <laughs> but, but I'm very grateful for it in my life, honestly. So when you're when you're writing, when you're working, um, and when you are with play uh, or or with with a screenplay, um, and then you're done for your your session, uh, and you get an idea, say you're in, you know at the sink and you're washing dishes, and then suddenly you think of a, a piece of dialogue or something, uh, do you run back and and enter it right then, or do, are you a note taker? Do you carry around a I don't carry around. I don't carry around a, a notepad. I I do jot things down. Um, I, I find that my memory is uh, not as resilient as it once was. Uh, and I also, when I'm really into the writing, I get a little spacey um, mm -hmm. because I'm. I so that's where the work is happening. Yes. So, so I will I will jot myself a note. 
I, you, I, do you find yourself sometimes when you're that something comes into your mind and you and oh that's a great line i'll remember that and then, <laughs> and then like like 15 minutes later it's like gone and you and you can't remember <laughs> what it was I, I have had that experience which is why i i write things down yeah. but i will tell but i'll tell you a little a little trade secret um when i'm writing i will um I mean, typically I give myself a, a, a kind of goal in terms of number of pages that I'm trying to hit. Uh -huh. If I hit that minimum, then I'm good, but I might plow if I'm, you know, if the muse is answering, I might really plow on. Right. But I, I will stop. Uh, I will stop my writing day before I complete that impulse, before I complete that scene. And the, and the psychology mm -hmm. behind that is that then the next day when I start, I'm picking up, I know exactly where I want to go. It's like priming the pump. So to be able to sit down and hit the ground running immediately, uh -huh. just kind of uh, primes uh, the, the motor and enables me to, to really get off to a good start. So it's just sort of an interesting trick uh, I, I play on myself. One of the other things that I, that I do and can recommend to my fellow writers out there, um, is that I do, uh, I do program my dreaming. I, I will, before I go to sleep, think about wow. whatever I'm, I'm wrestling with. Uh, it might be a scene that it's not happening quite the way I want, or I'm stuck, or I don't know where something goes. Um, and I will just um, remind myself of it uh, before I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. More often than not, it's not that I wake up with a dream in which I see the solution. It's, it's actually more interesting than that. Uh, I'll sit down to write, and the solution will present itself. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Of course, professional athletes do this all the time. Uh, scientific, a great deal of scientific evidence suggests that this kind of mental preparation and exercise um, actually pays physiological dividends, so why shouldn't it pay creative dividends as well? I think Paul McCartney wrote uh, yesterday uh, it, as the result of a dream. It came to him in a dream. Uh -huh. So, uh, it, do you have uh, anything on your writing desk? Uh, any little tchotchke or interesting little thing that, that either in, that you like to look at or in, or inspires you or um, you know, I have, I have a desk full of stuff. I, I have probably far too much stuff on my desk. Mm -hmm. Keep uh, I, I keep these little, uh, <laughs> these little these little insect uh, things, now, wind up did, toys. Did, wait, 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 wait. Where did that come from? Where um, I found it in a. In a <laughs> I've got a, I've got a whole bunch of these things, and they they really crack me up. Oh, someone on the on the chat is saying, I've got one of those too. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, James, oh, James Bennett is saying that. Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. I also I have this piece of art which I adore. I don't know if you're audience. Oh, that's nice. It's that it's looks like um Sparrow. Go ahead. But it's, it's made out of typewriter pieces. So this scoops. Uh, it's a sculpture in uh, Brooklyn who does these. He doesn't do them anymore, uh, but I, I adore everything about that. Wow. Uh, and then I have pictures. I, I have pictures of all the people I love, uh, you know, my partner and my kids. Of course. Uh, so it's a, I, I, I like these sort of totemic items. Yeah. They, make me feel, they make me feel comfortable. Uh, do you, do you have all stuff? I have a signed baseball, a Dodger baseball. Ah, are you serious? Uh, no, no, but uh, and I've got pictures of uh, a picture of my wife that I, I like to gaze at, uh, and, uh, which is always inspiring. It's uh, interesting these items that uh, that have you know meaning to it. I have, I have. We were talking about my father earlier. I have some of the seashells that he collected from the South Pacific and then put on to my mother. Mm. Um, and, and I have those, so, you know, just little power totems, I guess. 
Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, research uh, in your writing. Uh, so many of, uh, so much of your work uh, takes place in moments in American history, either both on stage and the things that you've written for film and television, and of course, you know, all the way in the Great Society and, and uh, your work in the Pacific and uh, all the others. Um, the amount of re the re and Kentucky cycle, of course. Um, talk talk to me and and uh, other writers who are watching about research and um, the importance of research of of, of um, um, immersing yourself into a world uh, without getting lost and keeping your compass and not losing your way and how to distinguish. Uh, a research material that is dramatic and usable versus other that is just informational um, and the process of figuring all of that out. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I love reading history and I love talking to people. So it's, it's not an onerous task at all. And, and the uh, potential pitfall that you allude to, the getting lost in your research or turning your research into an excuse not to write is, yeah. is yeah. certainly one that, uh, that I've experienced. But I, I think it's important. Uh, I think it's critical. You're going to tell a story that's not, uh, not your own, that you really put in the work to understand the people and the time and the culture and the milieu. This is not to say that um, you will become any sort of expert on it. That's not something that I ever call myself. Uh, it's not something even that I particularly uh, aspire to. You know, if you, if you want to read a great biography about LBJ, then, you know, there are plenty of options. And a lot right. of should be delivered a final installment any day here, God willing. Right. Um, you know, so that's not my job. Uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a dramatist. So I, you know, that means that out of this base of hopeful, well-researched understanding, I will tell a particular story in a very specific and limited time frame. Unlike Mr. Caro, I don't have 500 to 600 pages of time which my audience can pick up and put down at their leisure. They expect a full entertainment in two hours right. with a 15 minute intermission in between, which means that the story I tell will necessarily be narrower than a history. And that means that I will necessarily be making choices about what to omit and what to emphasize. And, um, so this is very much my point of view on this. And, and as a consequence, you know, uh, there are people who will feel um, unhappy with how I have presented what they consider to be facts or the way in which I presented the facts. And that's simply the price of doing business in this particular world. And I, I just accept it. Of course. But, but, I, but I think it's important to, to do that research and it can be um, it can be a lot of fun it, yeah. it can be it can really really be interesting um, for all the way in, in great society that the LBJ library is in Austin I think isn't it at the University of Texas yes and they yeah. were extremely generous as was uh, the LBJ family um, you know I uh, I, I talked to Anybody who would talk to me, uh, both in the family and those individuals who had served in uh, any part of the, the, his administration. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you my, uh, the, the first time I sat down with Lucy Baines Johnson, the, the younger daughter yeah. uh, of the two daughters, um, and the one who is sort of most publicly the keeper of the flame. And um, she had, uh, I, I, through my parents and their friends, I was able to reach out and say, look, this is who I am, this is what I do. I'm interested in writing a play, could I talk to you? 
And uh, so she agreed to, to meet me, suggested I come to her office. And uh, she was there waiting with her husband, um, who spent at least 15 minutes, I think, just trying to make sure that I wasn't crazy or I wasn't <laughs> Um, and then some signal must have been given and he, you know, he left us alone. So she's actually packing up the office and the office is full of these gorgeous black and white photographs of significant moments from her father's uh, time as president in these very beautiful elaborate silver frames. And she's packing them up while we're talking, which is kind of symbolic in its own way. And she shows me a picture and it's LBJ signing the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And he says, this is my daddy. And he signed, this is the 64 Civil Rights Act. And she then turns to me and there's a laser like focus suddenly, the, the Southern Bell has gone away. And she's like, and who did he give the first pin to? And, uh, you know, after you sign, after you sign the, the pin, right. this whole ceremony where the presidential pins and I, this right. was clearly my test right exactly and uh and honestly i know i had no fucking clue <laughs> so but i i i'm so proud of myself in this moment so i so i i just thought it out loud i said well okay it wouldn't have been anybody whose vote he already had so we could eliminate all the democrats we could eliminate Martin Luther King and the civil rights leaders. So it must have been a Republican. It probably would have been the Republican leadership. So it must have been Senator, Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen. And there was this moment and she said, you know, you are the first person who ever got that right. So I found that was, that That's was fantastic. Isn't that a great story? Um, now she she would go on to have some issues with with what I had written, and, uh, so it was not always a love fest. But yeah. I will say that she was very generous to me, and she needn't have been. Uh, she's uh, you know as part of that family, she's been on the receiving end of a tremendous amount of criticism right. over the years, and. Um, why she should help um, this playwright, you know, it was it was a generous thing to do. And did I they have to? Did, did the estate have to sign off on the on the on the no. script? No, 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 no. I, I I never give that kind of uh, leeway. I never give up my my control in that regard. I did give them uh, an early draft, and I did solicit their feedback. And um, it's another interesting story. They, you know, you know. I thought, well, they'll object to Vietnam, the way I'm handling Vietnam, or they'll object to the references to his infidelity, which were legion. Mm -hmm. But no, <laughs> um, the very first thing uh, that I came back to me from the collective of family and um, friends was, well, you know, the president never used the F word. Um, I, <laughs> why, why this should be what they bump on, uh, particularly when I know for a fact well, it's not true. I can't imagine BJ not using the app. I really, I mean, the man would take a dump in the, in, you know, at least talking to his aides, you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's so a, I think, I think, you know, this is, gentleman. this is my, this is my explanation for this. And it's, I think it's kind of revealing in a way. Uh, and, and certainly something that you encounter uh, as an artist when you're doing this kind of research. The, the individual who, who relayed this to me, this wonderful man, I'm quite, quite fond of, he's a true Southern gentleman and was part of LBJ's, uh, the last year of his final term in office. And, you know, the thing about LBJ is that he was many different people to many different people. Right. You know, whoever he was around, he became whoever he needed to be in order to get what he wanted from this person. So I have no problem believing that this man, this very gentle Southern gentleman, yeah. or heard the president use the F word. I think that's true. I believe that. Yeah. 
Do I believe that the president never is? Never? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so just kind of interesting that way. Tell me ab about um, the 12. Because I, 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 when I saw the, the, that you were, were developing that and working that, <laughs> that it's a, like a rock musical about the disciples and... And it, it, it's, it's less rock Jacob. than it was, but yes, it is. It is. Uh, this is with uh, Neil Berg, yeah, who's writing the music and co-writing the lyrics with me. And this is a project that we've actually been working on for quite some time. Like we, five years or so, right? Uh, uh, longer, than longer than that. And uh, we actually had a full production in Denver, very successessful production right. Right. In, in Denver. But we were... Um, we felt that we could still go further and we didn't feel we had exactly the right creative team. And, um, and now uh, John Doyle has joined us as director and John is the perfect director for this piece. It is, um, it does take a segment of the passion story, but it's one that I don't think has ever been dramatized, which one what is that? Thing to me, well, that's um, that's when all the uh, major characters are dead. Um, it's after the crucifixion, when the uh, disciples, uh, you know, they they're for, for starters, they're all blue collar, for the most part, uh, rural, uh, limited education, um, and they gave up everything they had. I mean, everything they had, yeah, uh, or small it might have been to follow this individual who they never entirely understood because he had this frustrating habit of speaking in these kind of koans and parables. It was very, it was exciting, but it was confusing. And they, uh, you know, they arrive in Jerusalem and they're rock stars, you know. Right. And a few days later, uh, he's been killed, uh, executed in this particularly gruesome way. And one of their own has betrayed him and uh, killed himself. And they are now being hunted. Um, and they, so everything's gone to hell in a handbasket and they retreat to the upper room, whatever that is. Maybe it's where the last supper was, maybe not, who knows. Um, and so they, they lock themselves in this room, they're hiding basically. Uh, and you can imagine how angry, confused, uh, despairing um, they are and they, 48 hours later, they leave the room prepared to teach an entirely new idea for which they will all die a terrible death. And the dramatic question then is, what the hell happened in the room? So that's the musical. It's just these people, these ordinary people, um, dealing with an extraordinary circumstance. And the, but what we hope to achieve here is something that is certainly for believers, uh, and, and I am not a, among that uh, group any longer, not for some time, but, but for believers that we will do justice um, and re respectfully um, to this story but that for those who don't or believe something else entirely will still speak uh, very personally because all of us have had a dark night of the soul where whatever it was we believed in, whatever we, we had devoted ourselves to, and it could have been a career, it could have been a cause, it could have been a marriage, um, and, and then it goes belly up and, and, and we're left there wondering not only why did that happen and, and, and how did that happen, but what can I do now? What can I possibly do now? How can I possibly go forward? Many of us are feeling that right now during this COVID. I, I, I think, uh, yes, uh, sadly, tragically, this is a piece that, that now um, reverberates even more broadly. Yeah. So I'm, and, and John Doyle, who has, uh, I'm sure your audience will know, but there may be some non-theater people watching, you know, has won two or three Tony Awards for best musical direction. Um, and, and his style, his aesthetic is a very bare uh, one, a very story theater one, which is very much my right. And, uh, and John Doyle 
<clears throat> interestingly, almost uh, went into the priesthood as a young man. He's a, he's a very spiritual guy, and, and to this day, a, a, a believer. And so he, his, you know, to, and then he discovered the theater and he became a director. Uh, <laughs> I, but, I, I, uh, <laughs> but he has all that and he brings all of that personal mm -hmm. experience and knowledge and passion to this project. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about this. I mean, it's a very bold and kind of risky piece. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, uh, but I, I, I look forward to the day, um, probably now, 22, you know, maybe latter half of 21, who can say for sure, uh -huh. when we can actually uh, put this up in this new, this new form. But I'm, I'm very excited about it. I have a number of theater projects. Um, that's the only musical that I'm working on, but I'm, but I'm super excited about it. Is this your, your first musical, Robert? I'm, it, it is really. That's what I thought. I don't yeah. recall, yeah. It's I love I love musicals. I'm, I love the form. Uh -huh. I'm a time fan, and uh, it's it's so much fun to be playing in this genre because your toolbox is so much bigger. You have so many other ways in which to tell a story or to <clears throat> emphasize uh, to, to uh, thread through um, recurring themes. Uh, it's it's very exciting it's, and challenging. I, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left uh, talking about COVID and, and, and when the 12 will see the light of day, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, with the, the virus closing theaters all across the country and, um, and the nation facing its own referendum on, on, on racism, um, and you're thinking about the American theater reopening again in, in 21, hopefully. Uh, when it does finally reopen, the American theater, uh, when we all reemerge from our caves and, and uh, step back into, uh, onto our stages again, uh, there'll be no going back. I think that there's a, we'll be stepping into a new world, uh, I, I think. Uh, what kind of, of of landscape do you think will be you'll be seeing uh, for the American theater, or or what landscape do you hope to see? Would you like to see? Well, I certainly hope that we don't go back. I, I think that's always uh, a pernicious uh, desire, uh, particularly when you come out of a crisis, uh, to to return to the comfort. Of familiarity, and and that would be a terrible mistake. Uh, you know, one should never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, this is an opportunity to rethink, reimagine, and reinvigorate the American theater, which has a lot of structural problems. Um, it uh, you know it is in its own way an expression of white supremacy. Yeah. Um, it's in, in its own way very much patriarchal. Um, you know, you, I, I belong to uh, the Lilies uh, uh, organization in New York, uh, famous for many things, but for The Count, um, which was a very nuts and bolts data-driven look at the place of women in the American theater um, on Broadway originally in New York and then across the country. Uh, and then for people of color. And, uh, and this is all before COVID and the, the numbers are shocking. You know, they're truly shocking. Um, we have work to do. So I hope that, um, that we take this opportunity and we actually really truly engage, uh, you know, we see you theater um, has some very, very cogent and uh, painful things to say uh, about the American theater as it's been practiced. And, uh, and we need to change that. We need to, we need to be uh, much more engaged. We need to reflect really the culture in which we live. We need to live uh, the words that we talk so often about. Um, I hope that we will see a more nimble theater. 
I hope that we will see a theater that's able to respond more quickly to events. I hope we will see a theater that is more financially available, uh, particularly in New York, where prices are mm -hmm. um, You know, it's a, it would be a terrible thing for this particular art form, which has so much to offer community, um, to price itself uh, into irrelevancy. Um, so I, there's a there's a lot of work to be done, and I, I think people are are aware of what the issues are. I think they're inescapable now; they're they're unavoidable. And the, the real question is: is is there the willpower to to do that? And um, and of course, we will all be struggling financially with the with the wreckage of of the system, both a system that uh, unfortunately put to my way of thinking far too much uh, effort and finances into inst into infrastructure rather than into people. Um, so now we're going to come out of this and that infrastructure is going to be in ruins because who can afford it? Um, and um, you know it's going to be it's going to be a challenging time but but I tell you um, the country needs us. Yeah. The country needs theater. It needs its artists. It, it needs its storytellers. You started off talking uh, in the beginning of this hour about how um, the story that we've been telling ourselves is, is under siege right. um, you know, by so many people who, who are now finally, in many cases, belatedly recognizing how false it is. And um, they need the storytellers. They need us to get out there and engage with our various communities and, and have these conversations, um, artistic conversations that we need to be having. That's, that's how progress will happen. That's how healing will happen. And, and that's how we will make the kind of theater that we all want to be a part of. Robert, um, Tony Kushner said uh, a handful of years ago I cannot make a living as a playwright. And this was after Angels in America. Um, talk to me about that, about the, the, the life of, uh, of playwriting versus screenwriting or television writing. Um, well, it's true. Um, I, I, like Tony, um, can't make a living as a playwright. Um, I don't know any playwright who can. Um, Everyone I know does something else as well. Uh, very often it's teaching. Um, uh, and if it's not teaching, then it's writing for film and television. And that's how I've chosen to support myself. And I I'm not just support myself, I, I truly do love working in these fields uh, and, and what it affords me. But it's a, it's a sobering situation. Um, to think that that one can succeed uh, and and have these measures, these accepted measures of success, and and really struggle financially. Uh, I had a terrible year this year, and that was before COVID. Uh, so I am, you know, I, it's, and I, I have really, it has kept me up at night thinking, okay, so what are we going to do? And what I've done is, you know, really double down on the film and the television work. And, and fortunately, um, I have work and, and it's exciting work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing what I'm going to be doing. I've got a, a TV series I'm working on with uh, Steven Spielberg and Amlin and another TV series with uh, Dick Wolf and NBC Universal. And, um, uh, several movies, you mentioned two of them that are, are at Amazon and hopefully, surely, <laughs> will eventually <laughs> start production. Uh, wouldn't that be crazy? Um, so, but it's, a, it's, yeah. it's challenging. It's, it's always been challenging. I know. And so many playwrights now are, are writing for television. Uh, and, and television is really embracing playwrights. Uh, it's in, it's an interesting dichotomy about TV because, on the one hand, um, the money can be good. It's not as good as it should be, 
let's be very honest, uh, television writers, actually all, all writers in Hollywood are not paid what they should be paid mm -hmm. given the value that they create. So let's just start with that. But, but by and large, uh, one can make a good living writing for film and television. And if, particularly for television, uh, a TV writer and series writer can really have a lot of aesthetic, uh, artistic control over their work, which is mm -hmm. unusual. One doesn't typically because, of course, and this is the thing that everybody needs to keep in mind, when you write for TV and film, you give up your copyright, um, like the stage where you retain your copyright. So that's the devil's uh, choice there in theater, not make much money or as a uh, the famous saying, you know, you, you can't make a living in the theater, but you can make a killing. Um, you know, the, the, the occasional every third decade killing, um, but you retain your copyright. Right. You own the material. Nobody can change it without your permission, as opposed to film or television, where you don't own your copyright and the owner, the studio, what have you, the network can change it at their will. It's a it's a very tough call, uh, and they're challenging. I want to get, uh, before we're done, I want to get to a couple of que questions here. Um, this is from Bill. Uh, he says, would, would Robert consider doing a play about the people from all races who have stepped up to fight Trump's wall, his caging of children and his horrible program of ethnic cleansing? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I... I, I do feel that in building the wall, I began to engage in, in precisely this kind of creative struggle. Mm -hmm. Certainly would love to continue to engage. Uh, and, and I think to highlight, as, as Bill, Bill uh, suggests, um, some of the more positive actions yeah. uh, so that we've seen, because people have really behaved heroically. That's been, you know, in so many cases, just ordinary citizens saying, I've had enough and, and, and becoming leaders without really intending to do so. And I think that's, that's an important story to be told. So yes, I, I would love to do that. I, as I think I mentioned earlier, I'm struggling right now to, to be able to write creatively to this exact moment to Trump. Um, I wish I could. Uh, I certainly think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, clearly there are a lot of writers out there who are and thank God for them. So. Uh, when we did Building the Wall at the Fountain, it was uh, polarizing for audiences and it caused a lot of post-show discussions and conversation, which of course is what we want. Um, Justin has a comment or a question. He says, when writing on polarizing subjects, as you often do, you're a very political writer, how do you handle offended uh, viewers if when they begin to violently get angry at you or, or express a contrary point of view? Have you have you been cornered in a lobby by some irate, you know, Trump? Sure. You know. Sure. Or or in public com or in public conversations. Yeah. yeah. No, I um, you know I really I try to engage uh, not in a reactive or defensive way but to understand what the objection or the criticism is. And, um, you know, just as a, it's, it's kind of a, a common um, tactic is maybe not the right word, but um, a good listening practice is to uh, repeat what someone has said to you back to them. It, it allows them to hear that you have heard them mm. in, is, is a good place to start, even if one doesn't get past that. So I, you know, I don't, I try not to get defensive and I try not to uh, uh, respond uh, immediately out of anger, or whatever, but I, but I will also hold my ground. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there to make anyone necessarily feel better about their racism or, um, you know, their blinkered uh, 
political worldview. Uh, that's not my job. Right. So, but, I, but I think the place I try to start at is one of, well, let's talk about that. What is it that you're feeling? I, what I'm hearing from you is X, Y, and Z. So that's where I'll start with it. Uh, understanding, please, that I never think I'm going to change anybody's opinion I, I, in that situation. I, I just, that's off the table. I don't, I don't even worry. I don't worry myself with that. It's really more about just engaging at a human level with this person whose point of view is so very, very different from mine and, uh, and allowing that to, to go wherever it takes us. That's, and that's the essence of theater, isn't it? It's conflict. And, and you're not, I don't think as a writer, you, you never write a, a piece to want to change people's mind about something or to, to convince them of a certain ideology. I, I, you're a storyteller, right? Well, I, you know, I, I, what I'd like to think that I do is that the work poses ultimately good questions. It doesn't give good answers. It poses good questions that the, the audience will take home and process as they will, uh, both consciously and unconsciously. I, I really think that's, that's the job uh, of a writer, unless the piece is, is uh, agitprop, which is a perfectly acceptable form of expression, uh, where you are, in fact, specifically challenging a particular viewpoint or trying to sell a particular political action or legislation. But by and large, the majority of the work I do is not that. And, uh, and what I'm trying to do is get people to sit a little bit outside of their normal comfort zone and begin to perhaps to view situations and issues slightly differently than their knee jerk reaction would be. If I do that, then I've done my job. Well, uh, certainly at the Fountain Theater, building the wall has stayed with our audiences for the past three years since it was uh, seen. So um, you certainly did your job there, Robert. Um, that was so, a, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful experience uh, at work and, and, uh, and you know, you, you don't get many of those. Uh, it's you, when, when it does happen, you really have to remind yourself in the moment to put a little bit of that in your hip pocket and because you're going to want to think about that. If you're going to need that. The days ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm very, very grateful to you, Stephen, and, and to the Found Theater and to the LA Theater community and the National New Play Network uh, yeah. for being such extraordinary collaborators in that particular moment. And it's been so nice to touch base with you again and to see you and, yeah. and chat with you. It's been really nice, Robert. Thank you. Yes, hopefully next time uh, it's in person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting on that your marvelous deck out there. That's uh, right. The <laughs> theater just before a show is about to open. Uh, <laughs> that be the next time we speak. Yeah, or I'll be in New York at the opening of the 12. Let's there hope. you go. That, there you go. All right. There thanks, Robert. Go. Thanks so much for, right. for, for joining us. Thank today. you. Thank you. And thanks to James Bennett for helping us out today and doing all the magic uh, behind the scenes. So that's it for, for Theater Talk for today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.